Twin-twin transfusion syndrome, commonly referred to as TTTS, is a complication of monochorionic or identical twins where the fetuses share one placental mass. TTTS is a very serious complication that requires immediate surveillance and treatment from a maternal fetal medicine specialist. Your pregnancy began as a single sperm fertilizing a single egg. This egg split very early in pregnancy between the second and fifth day after conception to create what is known as monozygotic twins, also known as identical twins. Identical twins are the same sex and share identical genetic characteristics. Although they are in two sacs, called amniotic cavities, the entire pregnancy is surrounded by a single outer membrane called the chorion. The medical term for identical twins, therefore, is monochorionic diamniotic. The one feature of monochorionic twins that results in complications is the fact that they share a common, single placenta. In the great majority of these cases, blood vessels connect the two blood systems of the twins with one another. Donor versus recipient twin. In about 10% of identical twins, a phenomenon known as twin-twin transfusion syndrome, TTTS, begins typically early in the second trimester. This calculates to approximately 1 in 58 cases of all twins and about 1 in 4,000 pregnancies. It is estimated that severe TTTS occurs in about 2,500 cases in the United States each year. Although the exact reasoning for TTTS is not well understood, the shared blood vessels in the single placenta contribute to the complication. Although shared blood vessels can be found in the placentas of all identical twins, different patterns of blood vessels are present in monochorionic twins that develop TTTS. TTTS is a complication that negatively affects both fetuses. Ultimately, one twin loses some of its blood volume to the other twin. The twin that loses blood volume is identified as the donor twin. The donor twin stops producing urine, making it difficult or impossible to see the bladder in an ultrasound. Since most of the fluid surrounding a fetus at this point in the pregnancy is the result of fetal urine, the fluid in the sac of the donor decreases, a term called oligohydramnios, and ultimately, the donor becomes stuck in its sac against the wall of the uterus. Meanwhile, the other fetus, known as the recipient twin, receives too much blood from the donor. The recipient twin begins to go into heart failure and tries to protect itself by producing more urine. A large bladder can be seen on ultrasound and the presence of excess amniotic fluid around the recipient twin is known as polyhydramnias. Again, the primary problems stem from the shared blood vessels in the placenta. This is a picture of an actual placenta that has been injected with colored dyes. The umbilical cord of the donor twin can be seen connecting to the placenta at the lower left of the picture. The recipient twin's umbilical cord can be seen at the bottom right of the picture. One will note that there is a blue vessel connecting to an orange vessel in the form of an arteriovenous or AV anastomosis. This is one of the main connection problems that cause TTTS. The arrows indicate the flow of blood from the donor to the recipient. This circle indicates a green vessel connected to a blue vessel representing an arterio-arterial or AA anastomosis. Here, the arrow indicates blood flow from the recipient twin to the donor twin. This placenta is showing a balanced circulation from a set of normal monochorionic twins without TTTS. The presence of the AA anastomosis is thought to be protective from the development of twin-twin transfusion. Five stages of TTTS. TTTS can be described in the form of five stages, first described by Dr. Ruben Quintero. In stage one TTTS, there is relatively little fluid around the donor twin, as depicted by the red arrow. The donor twin is also referred to as the stuck twin. One can see in this picture that the membrane closely surrounds this particular fetus. The maximum vertical pocket of amniotic fluid from the front to the back of the womb is measured by ultrasound is less than two centimeters. To the right of this picture, one can see a measurement of the deepest vertical pocket in the recipient twin sac. By definition, in stage 1 TTTS, this pocket should measure 8 to 10 centimeters. A normal pocket of amniotic fluid would measure 5 to 6 centimeters. In stage 2 TTTS, the amniotic fluid discrepancy is present, but now a bladder is no longer seen as indicated by the arrow in the donor or stuck twin. 
Specialized studies called Doppler ultrasound look at blood flow in three blood vessels of each of the twins to determine if they are normal. In stage 3 TTTS, there is an abnormal blood flow in either the donor or the recipient twin. The first blood vessel that is typically studied is the umbilical artery in the umbilical cord. In the first panel on the left, one sees a normal umbilical artery blood flow. Notice that there is evidence of flow as indicated by the arrow, even when the heart rests between beats. This resting part of the heartbeat is called diastole, so diastolic flow is called present. In the panel below, note that when the heart is at rest, the blood is actually moving in a reverse fashion as indicated by the circle. This is known as reverse diastolic flow in the umbilical artery. This finding is usually seen in the donor twin and is associated with intrauterine growth restriction, IUGR, in this fetus. Blood flow is also measured in the umbilical vein of the umbilical cord. The left panel shows normal flow, while the right panel illustrates pulsatile flow consistent with heart failure. This is usually seen in the recipient fetus. In the right two panels, the blood flow in the ductus venosus is depicted. The ductus venosus is a blood vessel that returns blood from the lower body to the baby's heart. Abnormal blood flow in this particular blood vessel would indicate heart failure, which is again typically seen in the recipient twin. The top panel illustrates a normal ductus venosus, while the bottom panel, as illustrated in the circle, reveals reversed flow during diastole. Again, this is a very abnormal finding that usually occurs in the recipient twin and can indicate impending heart failure. Although not part of the original Quintero staging system, blood flows in the brains of both babies are also studied by measuring the flow in the middle cerebral artery. The speed of the blood in the middle cerebral artery can be used to detect anemia, which means a low blood count or polycythemia, too high a blood count in the fetuses. In stage 4 TTTS, there is evidence of fetal high drops, which is an increased amount of fluid typically seen in the abdomen of the fetus. This usually occurs in the recipient fetus. Here the arrow depicts extra fluid in the abdomen of the fetus, a condition known as ascites, indicating congestive heart failure in this very late stage of TTTS. In stage 5 of TTTS, one or both of the fetuses has died as a result of their disease. In these cases, a treatment cannot be instituted. However, if one of the fetuses survives the death of its co-twin, there can be a chance for brain or neurologic damage of the surviving twin. This will be addressed later in this video. There are two other conditions that occur in monochorionic twins, selective growth restriction, or SIUGR, and twin anemia polycythemia sequence, or TAPS. Both of these conditions can occur with TTTS, or they can occur as separate diseases. SIUGR occurs in about 10 to 15 percent of identical twins. Unlike TTTS, its primary cause appears to be that the smaller twin does not have as much placenta as its larger co-twin. This difference develops early in the pregnancy when the placenta is first forming. Because the smaller twin has less placenta, it receives fewer nutrients and therefore its growth is stunted. SIUGR is typically diagnosed when one twin is growth restricted and has less amniotic fluid than its co-twin. Unlike the case with TTTS, the larger twin has a normal amount of amniotic fluid. One of the concerns with this condition is the possibility of the in utero death of the affected twin before the pregnancy has progressed to a point where the twins could survive outside of the womb in a neonatal intensive care unit. Because the twins are connected by blood vessels in the placenta, the death of one twin can lead to the rapid passage of blood from the normal twin to the dying twin. This occurs immediately with the death of the twin. Therefore, premature delivery after the death of one twin has been detected will not change the outcome. In about 15% of cases, the normal twin will also die. In another 25% of cases, the normal twin will survive, but it will suffer brain damage. Unfortunately, there are no good tests to predict brain damage in the surviving fetus. A measurement of the speed of the blood moving through the brain, called middle cerebral artery Doppler, can be performed to check for anemia in the surviving twin. An MRI can also be done several weeks after the co-twin's death to evaluate for brain damage in the surviving twin.
However, we are still not sure how predictive these tests are for telling a couple that their surviving co-twin has not suffered any damage. There are no good treatments for SIUGR since it is related to the smaller amount of placenta supplying nutrients to the smaller twin. Selective reduction has been proposed as the best option to protect the normally grown twin from the consequences of a co-twin death. Laser therapy has been proposed by some centers, but this usually leads to the death of the IUGR fetus. If performed properly, however, laser can prevent blood from moving through the connecting blood vessels in the placenta, thereby protecting the normal twin should the IUGR twin die. Finally, conservative management can lead to the birth of two fetuses, though they are often born very premature. Twin anemia polycythemia sequence, or TAPS, is another complication of monochorionic twins. It occurs spontaneously in only about 1-2% to of identical twins. TAPS can also occur with TTTS or as a separate disease. As you will learn later, it can also occur as a complication after laser therapy for TTTS. In TAPS, small blood vessels connect the circulation of the twin fetuses and allow a few red blood cells to continuously move from one twin to its co-twin. This will result in one twin having a low blood count, or anemia, and one twin having too high a blood count, polycythemia. On ultrasound, the fluid may be seen as normal in both twins' sacs. TAPS is suspected when one twin develops high drops or when a special ultrasound called middle cerebral artery Doppler detects that the blood is moving very fast in a blood vessel in the fetal brain. The best treatment for TAPS is unknown, but laser therapy, selective reduction, intrauterine blood transfusion to the anemic twin, and early delivery have all been reported. There are several therapeutic options for the treatment of TTTS. The first of these is expectant management. Unfortunately, without treatment over 90% of cases of severe TTTS presenting in the early second trimester will result in the loss of both fetuses. In the majority of these cases, this is due to increasing polyhydramnios in the sac of the recipient twin leading to either preterm, premature rupture of the membranes, or premature labor with delivery before the fetuses can survive outside the womb. For many years, amnio reduction had been the gold standard of treatment for TTTS. A needle is placed into the sac of the recipient twin to remove the extra fluid by using either gravity or a suction apparatus. This can relieve the pressure that is caused by the excess fluid. Unfortunately, this procedure must be repeated every several days to once a week as the fluid reaccumulates rapidly. This is due to the fact that the actual problem the blood vessels that are shared in the placenta is not addressed by this treatment option. Studies have shown that more than 69% of patients need more than one procedure. Survival of at least one fetus is said to occur in 52% of pregnancies. Approximately 26% of pregnancies result in one living fetus, and another 26% result in two living fetuses. However, because the shared placental blood vessels are not addressed by this option, Neurologic problems occur in as many as 25% of surviving fetuses. Premature rupture of the membranes complicates 9% of these pregnancies. Abruption, which is premature separation of the placenta from the wall of the womb, resulting in the need for delivery, is said to occur in 3% of cases. Chorioamnionitis, an infection of the bag of waters, occurs in approximately 1% of cases. The gestational age at delivery in general is approximately 29 weeks, or about 7 months. Occasionally, selective reduction of one twin may be necessary in severe TTTS for one of the following reasons. The condition can be associated with severe disease in a short cervix. In these situations, the risk for premature delivery after a laser procedure is very high. In addition, one of the fetuses can have a major birth defect that is life-limiting. Another reason is that one of the fetuses can be severely growth-restricted with a poor likelihood of survival due to having less of a placental share than its co-twin. Finally, the umbilical cord insertions of the twins into the placenta may be too close to one another to allow for a successful laser procedure. 
In these cases, selective reduction of the affected twin may be the preferred treatment for TTTS. The procedure is usually accomplished with a specialized needle using ultrasound to guide it to the umbilical cord insertion of the affected fetus. A special energy generator is then used to stop the blood flow in the umbilical cord. The heartbeat will then stop in this fetus. It will remain in the womb until the delivery of the normal twin later in pregnancy and will not cause any problems for the mother or the remaining co-twin. Risks of the procedure include Unintended loss of the co-twin in 15 to 20% of cases, preterm premature rupture of membranes, or PPROM, occurring in 10% of cases within 4 weeks and 20% of cases prior to 37 weeks gestation, preterm delivery with mean gestational age of delivery for surviving neonates of 36 weeks gestation, or long-term developmental delay in the co-twin survivors of approximately 8%, Laser photocoagulation of the connecting, or anastomotic vessels, is considered the gold standard of treatment for patients with severe TTTS. In laser photocoagulation, a fetoscope is inserted into the sac of the recipient twin and used to locate the shared blood vessels in the placenta. This device is a small telescope that is approximately the size of a drinking straw. The vessels are then coagulated or spot welded with a laser that is introduced through a small fiber into the amniotic cavity. Laser is usually performed between 16 and 26 weeks of gestation for stage 2 to 4 TTTS. Most cases of stage 1 TTTS are watched with weekly ultrasounds since more than 50% of these cases will resolve on their own without treatment. Laser is offered as therapy in some cases of stage 1 TTTS, such as when there is a short cervix, or when the polyhydramnias causes extreme symptoms in the mother. In the only randomized study of laser compared to amnioreduction, there was a marked improvement in intact neurologic outcome of babies with laser therapy. Premature rupture of membranes is still a problem in about 30% of the cases, since the fetoscope must be introduced into the bag of waters. Unlike serial amnioreductions, where the mean gestational age was 29 weeks gestation, the mean gestational age at the time of delivery after laser therapy is approximately 32 weeks, almost three weeks further into the pregnancy than amnioreduction. Here one sees a view through the fetoscope into the amniotic fluid cavity of the recipient twin. Blood vessels from the surface of the placenta are being followed back to the umbilical cord leading to two sets of connecting vessels. The green light is the aiming laser which is used to decide where the actual laser will fire, and the white mark indicates the vessels that are coagulated. Here the first anastomosis and then the second anastomosis are lasered. Here, the vessel has been completely coagulated. At the end of the procedure, the coagulated vessels are connected with the laser in a procedure called the Solomon Technique. This decreases the chance of any remaining vessels that might be missed by the procedure. When compared side by side with amnioreduction, Laser coagulation results in a higher percentage of pregnancies with one or both fetuses surviving, a later gestational age at delivery, and a lower incidence of neurological abnormalities. In some cases, after the fetoscope has been placed in the uterus, the donor twin is found to be covering the connecting vessels. Since the donor twin is stuck and cannot be moved, the connecting vessels cannot be coagulated. In other cases, the amniotic fluid may be too bloody at the start of the procedure, or bleeding during the procedure may make the fluid too bloody to see the blood vessels on the placenta to perform the laser. In these situations, a specialized forceps can be passed through the same plastic tube that was used to insert the fetoscope. The umbilical cord of one of the twins is then grasped, and electrical energy is applied to stop the blood flow in the umbilical cord. The heartbeat of this fetus will stop, the fetus will remain inside the womb for the remainder of the pregnancy, but will not result in any increased risk to the mother or the surviving co-twin. Survival of the co-twin typically occurs in 85% of cases with approximately 8% having some neurologic problems. The gestational age at delivery of the remaining fetus is typically 36 weeks gestation. Survival of at least one fetus is said to occur in 90% of pregnancies 
after laser therapy for TTTS. In 70% of cases, both fetuses survive. In 20% of cases, one fetus survives. In the remaining 10% of pregnancies, both babies do not survive. Follow-up studies of babies treated with laser indicate a 6% rate of major neurologic problems in survivors. Major problems include blindness, deafness, and cerebral palsy. Many of these neurologic problems are related to the gestational age at which the fetuses are born. Fetuses after laser therapy will be born prematurely. This is often the result of leakage of amniotic fluid, which occurs in up to 30% of cases. Should this occur, you will typically be hospitalized for the remainder of the pregnancy and watched carefully for signs of infection. The average gestational age for spontaneous delivery after laser is about 32 weeks. In rare cases, despite careful mapping of the connecting vessels on the placenta at the time of the laser procedure, a small vessel may have been missed. In other rare situations, a vessel that has been lasered may reopen. These cases are usually detected in the first few weeks after the procedure, so your referring perinatologist will be asked to perform a weekly ultrasound for at least six weeks after the procedure. Open vessels can result in the return of TTTS. Alternatively, one of the babies, usually the former recipient twin, can develop a low blood count, known as anemia, while the former donor develops a high blood count, called polycythemia. As mentioned earlier in this video, this condition is known as TAPS. Treatment options for the complication of recurrent TTTS, or TAPS, include a repeat laser or selective reduction. In some cases of TAPS, a transfusion of red blood cells can be given to the anemic fetus in a procedure called an intrauterine transfusion. Although laser has advantages for the fetus over other procedures, it entails some minimal risks to the mother. These include infection in less than 1% of cases, abdominal pain from leakage of amniotic fluid into the abdomen once the fetoscope has been removed. This occurs in about 3% of cases. The leaked fluid will be removed by your body over several days. Another risk is abruption, which is a separation of the placenta from the wall of the womb resulting in bleeding into the uterus. This occurs in about 1% of cases. This complication can be very serious and may result in the need for blood transfusions or even delivery by emergent cesarean section, even though the fetuses are typically too young to survive. And a rare complication includes maternal pulmonary edema, which is fluid in the mother's lungs. Patients referred to the fetal center will undergo a series of evaluations and consultations to determine the best treatment option for the family. A clinical coordinator will contact you to provide instructions on how to travel to the fetal center and when to arrive. On some occasions, you may be asked not to eat or drink anything the night before you arrive as you may need to go to surgery the same day you are seen. Your initial consultation will begin with a vaginal ultrasound performed by a technician to check the length of your cervix. An abdominal ultrasound will then be performed to evaluate the fetuses and determine the stage of the TTTS. An echocardiogram, an ultrasound of the baby's hearts, will be performed. You will then meet an affiliated fetal interventionist who will talk with you about the best course of treatment for your pregnancy. If a decision is made to move forward with a fetal intervention, you will be asked to sign a surgical consent. In the case of a planned laser procedure, the attending fetal medicine physician will discuss Plan B with you. This is a difficult decision for a couple. Plan B involves performing a selective reduction at the time of the laser surgery if one of the twins appears to be dying or if the laser cannot be completed due to complications. You and your partner will be asked to wait to make your final decision regarding Plan B until the morning of surgery. A member of the research team will also meet with you to explain several research studies on twin-twin transfusion. If you agree to participate, you will be asked to sign consent forms for these. You will meet a resident or fellow in training, a physician who will perform a complete history and physical under the supervision of a UT Health faculty physician. One of the nurse coordinators will then take you to the hospital to have blood drawn for surgery. An armband will be attached to your wrist for identification should you need a blood transfusion during your hospital stay.
It is very important that you do not remove this armband. Your nurse coordinator will also provide you with instructions regarding surgery the following day. Do not eat or drink anything beginning at midnight the night before surgery. This is very important and cannot be overemphasized. Several patients have had their cases canceled because they drank liquids the morning of surgery. If you would like to brush your teeth on the morning before surgery, do this with a minimal amount of water and do not swallow any of the water. On the morning of your scheduled surgery, you will go to the fifth floor of Children's Memorial Herman Hospital. There you will meet with an admitting clerk who will take you to the preoperative area on the sixth floor. There you will have an IV started. An ultrasound will be performed to assess the status of your babies just prior to surgery. You will also meet the affiliated anesthesiologist who will take care of you during surgery. The surgical consent will be finalized, including your final decision regarding Plan B. You will be provided with a bitter drink which will reduce the acid in your stomach. You will be given a medication through your IV to relax you, and then you will be taken to the operating room on a stretcher. Your family can accompany you, but they will not be allowed to go into the operating room. They will be instructed on where to wait during the surgery. Typically, your laser surgery will be performed with local anesthesia in your skin and special medicines given through your IV by the anesthesiologist. This is called conscious sedation. Patients report being very comfortable during the procedure and often do not remember their time in the operating room. In some situations, you may be put to sleep which is called general anesthesia. Particular situations that call for general anesthesia may include difficulty breathing because of the large amount of fluid in your recipient twin sac. General anesthesia is also used in about 10% of laser cases because the placenta is on the front side of the womb and there is no good location to place the fetoscope. In these cases, a pediatric surgeon assists in the case by performing laparoscopy, which is the placement of a second telescope into your abdomen to safely guide the placement of the fetoscope into the womb. Three incisions will be made on your abdomen for an open laparoscopy. One incision is located just below your breastbone and two smaller ones are located near each other on the right or left lower side of your abdomen. Once you are asleep, the pediatric surgeon will assist the fetal interventionist by placing a laparoscope and a manipulator into your abdomen to move the uterus forward. While the affiliated surgical team watches with the ultrasound, a fetoscope will then be placed through the back of the uterus so that the placenta can be avoided. The typical laser surgery takes one to two hours. Once your surgery has been completed, you will be taken to the recovery room. There you will be checked in with a nurse in labor and delivery and will remain in the recovery room for two to four hours. You will then be admitted to the fifth floor of Children's Memorial Herman Hospital. There you will be in a private room with a private bathroom for a one to two day post-op stay. After a typical laser procedure, you will only stay one night. Patients who require an open laparoscopy to assist with their laser procedure will often stay two days. Your spouse, partner, or one family member can stay with you in your room. When you awaken from surgery, you may experience some soreness at the incision site. However, the incision is very small, about a fourth of an inch. You may have a few contractions, but these usually go away in the first 12 hours after surgery. You will be able to eat a diet that your body can tolerate, and you will have bathroom privileges. An IV will be used to treat you with antibiotics, and you will receive oral medications to prevent contractions. Oral pain medications will be prescribed as needed. If you have had an open laparoscopy, you may be given a patient-controlled anesthesia or PCA device to provide intravenous narcotics through your IV when you push a button. On the morning after surgery, your IV will be removed. You can remove the bandage from your incision site after you take a shower. The surgical site can get wet at this point in your recovery. Typically, the morning following surgery, a brief ultrasound will be performed in your room to confirm that your babies are okay. Then you will be discharged and taken by wheelchair back to the clinic where you were first seen. There you will undergo a more extensive ultrasound. While you are in town, you can contact the fetal center at 832-325-7288 and request to speak with a physician on call should any problems arise, including suspected fever or chills.
leaking fluid from the vagina, bleeding, more than four contractions per hour, or any unusual pain. If for any reason you are unable to contact a physician through the answering service, we ask that you return to the Children's Memorial Herman Hospital emergency room and ask that the fetal surgery physician on call be paged. If you have come from a distant city and you need to fly home, it is safe to do so on the second day following your surgery. If you have driven to the fetal center from your hometown, you may leave the same day you are discharged. Once you are discharged home, we would ask you to remain at relative bed rest for at least one week. We will ask you to take your temperature every evening for at least one week and to call your local obstetrician if you detect a temperature of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or greater. Other reasons to contact your local OB would include leaking fluid from the vagina, bleeding, more than four contractions per hour, or unusual pain. If the steris strip over your incision has not fallen off on its own, you can remove it after one week. There are no stitches below this to be removed. Please contact your referring MFM or maternal fetal medicine specialist to make an appointment for your ultrasound one week after you return home. The fetal center has already contacted your MFM by phone and he or she will be expecting your call. Your MFM will perform weekly ultrasounds for six weeks, followed by ultrasounds every two weeks thereafter. Start antenatal testing with non-stress tests or biophysical profiles at 30 weeks of gestation. The timing and method of your delivery will be determined by your local MFM and obstetrician, although most patients after laser therapy are delivered by cesarean section. If you have not delivered by 37 weeks, your doctor will recommend that your fetuses be delivered. The team of fetal interventionists affiliated with the fetal center is a leader in the diagnosis, treatment, and comprehensive care of mothers diagnosed with complicated monochorionic pregnancies. We hope this video has been instructive and answered some of your questions. The goal of the fetal center is to support you through this difficult time and help you through your pregnancy and delivery. Thank you very much for your time.